Princess Elizabeth and Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten at Westminster Abbey on the 20th of November 1947 attracted the largest radio audience in Australia. A week later, newsreels of the royal wedding could be seen in all capital cities and many country towns. In 1948, Labour Prime Minister Chifley announced that Princess Elizabeth's father, the King, had accepted his invitation to visit Australia. It was to be the first visit of a reigning monarch, although, as the Duke of York, he had presided over the opening of Parliament House in Canberra in 1927. Souvenir manufacturers were quick to capitalise on the proposed tour. George VI was a popular king, familiar to Australian audiences from wartime newsreels, showing him inspecting troops and bomb-damaged London. However, the Australian tour had to be cancelled because of the king's failing health. Menzies, because he's seen as the great royalist, is always regarded as the politician who is most sensitive and clever about using the royal family. But in fact, uh, in 1948, Prime Minister Chifley, the Labour Prime Minister, invites the then King, King George VI, to visit Australia. In 1949, everybody assumed the tour was on, extraordinary array of souvenirs and portraits were produced, and one could speculate that if uh, the King had actually fronted, that Chifley and the Labour Party would have won the 1949 election. Instead, the Liberal Country Party coalition, led by Robert Menzies, won the election. Soon after, Menzies renewed the royal invitation, but instead of the King, he was offered Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh. Australians were told that during the tour... There will be no gold-panelled coaches, as there are when their majesties pass through London on state business. No Tudor uniforms in gold and scarlet. These they will have left behind in England, a land rich in traditional ceremony. Australia is a new country, her roots as yet hardly below the surface of the soil of history. What little pomp and circumstance exists in our civic and corporate lives has been borrowed from the old country, the home of our fathers. In memory of our beloved king. The king's death in February 1952 saw the empire in mourning. Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh, already en route to Australia, returned for the funeral. Tens of millions of children throughout the British Commonwealth sorrow at the passing of a well-loved king and rejoice in the accession of a young and beautiful girl who from this day forth shall be their queen. In a school near Sydney, a simple touching ceremony symbolizes their faith and their love. Australians waited impatiently for the arrival of newsreel footage of the Queen's coronation in June 1953, and even more impatiently for the often postponed royal tour. A high history for Australia. Finally, the great day came. On Wednesday, the 3rd of February, 1954, Sydney siders watched, and the rest of Australia waited, for news of the SS Gothic's passage up Sydney Harbour. A city and a continent are waiting for a queen is coming a queen we have never seen all sections of australian society united in welcome the catholic weekly told its readers for years the people of australia have waited for this day when their sovereign ruler would come in person to receive the testimony of their tremendous affection and loyalty During the 1938 sesquicentenary celebrations, Australia had to be content with a minor member of English nobility, the Earl de la Ware. A monarchical visit was long overdue. The preparations for the tour had been extraordinary. The Commonwealth and every state government published tour manuals, and Australians had been well briefed on dress and etiquette. Large format illustrated books carried imperial and monarchical messages, and the youth market was skillfully targeted. In his book, Royalty and Australia, Rex Ingemulls, an Australian patriot, pointed out that 
Every legislative act that passes through our parliaments requires the royal assent to make it law. Cabinet ministers are ministers of the crown, the civil services, the police force, the defense forces operate under the royal authority. All state enterprises are conducted under their authority. In all these and many other ways, the Crown orders and safeguards our daily life so effectively that we hardly need pause to consider the wonder of such machinery. The Crown was so entrenched in Australian life that government schools in Victoria were issued with Elizabeth Regina doormats. Prime Minister Menzies contributed a foreword to Ingemill's book. Echoing the school assembly pledge of his childhood, Menzies told his fellow subjects that in the person of a monarch, such as the young and lovely Elizabeth II, the crown is also the focus of a profound nationwide emotion. We love the queen. We honor the queen. We serve the queen. Her youth and beauty added to the enchantment of the royal progress. Australians marveled, as historian Ken Inglis puts it, because they could finally see the face on the money, smiling in their own streets. Out of the morning sun steams the royal liner Gotham. Lock Townsend, a member of the Commonwealth Government Film Unit covering the 1954 tour, has vivid memories of the 4th of February in that year. Jane Connors is currently researching the tour. So she actually came in summer. You must have got pretty hot in your suit. It was a hell of a hot day. And as that, the Gothic came down Sydney Harbour, I was in the little lighthouse on Bradley's Head, which was all glass underneath it, with a recorder recording all that sound that you hear at the beginning of the film of the toots of the boats and horns. Then I was taken by boat over to Elizabeth Bay, where I met Reg Pierce, who's one of the cameramen, and we went and got on the corner of Park Street, right, right up to the town hall, and got our camera gear up, and I went through the crowd and got crowd people, close-ups of kids and people like that. At Farm Cove, on the very spot where Australian history began, Sir William Slim and Mr. Robert Menzies welcome her ashore. I think this is when Robert Menzies, you know, he, he just became her Australian father from the moment she hit the ground. She was terribly young, she was very inexperienced and incredibly nervous. I thank you and your alderman most sincerely for the welcome you have given me and my husband. Oh, look at that, Val. Isn't she lovely? In the weeks that followed, the Queen and the Duke had a strenuous program, visiting ex-servicemen and women, war widows, assorted clergy, surf carnivals, and, of course, the races. School children were mobilized in every state, not because the authorities feared small crowds, but because love of the monarch was preached in government and many non-government schools. For the last time, Billy Jones, will you stop pushing? At Melbourne Cricket Ground, the proposed site for the 1956 Olympic Games, children from Victorian state schools carry out a remarkable mass display. This display is without a doubt a credit to the physical education instructors and the hundreds of children of all ages who are taking part. The tiny tots are magnificent as they carry out the movements of a nursery story. I was eight years old at the time when the Queen came. And um, I just, I was a student at a primary school. I was in the Maypole. And I remember we got tangled. And the other thing I remember also was that um, we, put, we formed part of a, there was a big human welcome which was formed across the ground. I just remember that we had to rehearse it. Um, quite, quite at length uh, prior to her arrival and the event happened very quickly so that whilst you sort of come here and you sit around for a very, very long time and then it sort of happened and finished. Mm. Like any event, 
it creates its own excitement and having all those school children there you know you, you felt you were you were part of a significant event i suppose we were excited about seeing the queen but i can't remember being particularly excited about it perhaps that was a little bit of an anti-climax i have very very fond memories of the whole thing not that i'm particularly um, enamored by the queen but but there was something very special, I think, for me as a child at that time. Um, I came from a family, we were, we were refugees and we'd come out here post-war in 48 and we didn't speak English very well and uh, um, my parents had a rather left-wing background and certainly were not interested in monarchs of any kind or in nationalism particularly. And yet we all got caught up in it. It's very hard to find any person or any organisation that didn't embrace the royal progress. Well, when I started looking, because of the amount of opposition we find to the Queen now, and because of what we know about groups like the Irish Catholics and the Communists in other parts of our history, I just assumed that there would have been a lot of fuss about the Queen and that probably it had been repressed. And if I looked hard enough, I could find out that people hadn't been as happy as we'd been led to believe. But I've come to the conclusion now that that just isn't true. In a couple of years, in the early 50s, uh, I think the uh, Catholic school system became quite loyalist. I think that uh, by the time my little brother was in high school, uh, the picture of the young queen was on the wall. And we have to understand that those were days of, of great anti-communist frenzy. Um, and some of it was well-based. Stalin, who is a monster of the 20th century, uh, was in the Kremlin still. And the young queen with her benign looks, the young monarch who'd been broadcasting to the empire from the age of 14, um, she seemed a better bet for, uh, for all purposes than the sort of saturnine face of Joe Stalin, who looked like the cat who had just swallowed democracy's canary. People lined railway tracks to see the royal train. The only chance that many Australians had to see their majesties was a fleeting glimpse as the royal train swept by. This carriage took the royal couple around New South Wales. In Wagga, 100,000 people, an enormous crowd for a city with a population of 18,000, lined the streets. At the Wagga leg of the tour, Joe Timbery, his wife and children, were specially invited to demonstrate boomerang throwing at the Bushman's Carnival. Well, at the time, my father was world champion boomerang thrower. Uh, in 1952, he won the Australian title, and world title boomerang throw competition. And he was pretty well famous then, you know, and um, he won just about everything he went into. Now the boomerang throwing, an ancient art handed down to modern Aborigines from their Stone Age ancestors. It's an art that can never fail to thrill, and the royal visitors are keenly interested. It's the queen that shook me dad's hand, shook me mum's hand, she come, she come to me, she shook I wiped my hand on my pants like that. Wiped any dust out of my pants and shook her hands. She said to me, um, she said, you're a young chap to be trying a boomerang. But I really like for myself now, if I've ever met the Queen, I'd like to say, uh, do you remember me? I'm the chap who threw boomerangs for you back in 1954 with me dad and me, me sisters, you know? Do you remember meeting me? In Canberra, the Queen addressed a joint sitting of both Houses of Parliament. Eight institutions of parliamentary sovereignty, a democratically controlled executive, the just and impartial administration of the law. These exist and flourish in each of the great realms which call me Queen. Her Majesty unveiled, in an audacious display of counter-imperialism, the Australian National Memorial to America, commemorating the American contribution to the war in the Pacific.
The royal progress in 1954 represented the acme of British monarchical and imperial symbolism. The regular church services, investitures, banquets and balls were all an attempt to recreate court life in the Antipodes. Pomp and circumstance surrounded the royal couple everywhere. People usually talk about the royal tour as if it was a circus orchestrated personally by Prime Minister Robert Menzies. And I don't think that's borne out by the information I've found at all. I mean, obviously Menzies adored the Queen, and made himself omnipresent and took a certain amount of hand in the preparations that were made. So he, he, he was there and he was extremely influential, but that really underestimates the amount of time and planning that went into this tour. A great deal of the organisation was done by the military because we had a demobilised army, um, more or less, and so uh, and the Queen is very identified with the military and was partly here to thank our soldiers for the war effort during World War II. So the military played an enormous role in organising the itinerary. So did the bureaucrats, the federal bureaucrats and bureaucrats in each state. And my favourite story is in Mount Gambia in South Australia, a, a small town, and the Queen was due to be there between about 12.25 in the afternoon and a quarter to two. So an extremely short visit, she flew in from Adelaide. And 12 subcommittees met for a year to coordinate this visit, which basically involved her driving into town, planting a tree, which is still there, and driving out again. And that, that just involves an amount of labour we can't quite imagine. So while it was such a quintessential event of the Menzies era, and Menzies had a lot to do with it, I think to discount the hundreds of thousands of hours put in by the people gives a very false impression. One journalist in the AM Weekly expressed embarrassment on behalf of his fellow Australians about the unedifying scramble for invitations to official functions, not to mention the black market that developed for ladies' tickets to the Royal Race Day at Randwick Racecourse. But of course, you remember that to do here, she was to land in uh, Farm Cove. And uh, there was a dispute between Labour Premier Carl, New South Wales, and uh, Coalition Prime Minister Menzies. And uh, Carl said, uh, but she's uh, landing in New South Wales. Uh, I'll greet her. And uh, Menzies said, uh, well, in that case, uh, Perhaps we should bring her by air from New Zealand to Canberra. So they came to the elegant compromise. She came in on the ship and landed at a pontoon, which the feds erected. So Menzies and his ministers made their bows. Then she was past the car, uh, on the rear part of the pontoon. They made their bows. And Joe Carl took her onto the landing stage and introduced her to the Lord Mayor and the state uh, dignitaries. After that, for many years, the Queen always came by air to Canberra or to Darwin. Aborigines figured prominently in the tour, as if Aborigines and Aboriginal motifs were the only real Australian iconography that Europeans could muster. In Toowoomba, they saw the age-old ceremonial of the corroboree, performed by tribal Aborigines. The all-white departments that administered Aboriginal affairs in the States welcomed the tour in their official publications. Rex Ingemels in Royalty and Australia saw no disjunction between celebrating the Australian environment, which included the Aboriginal population, and his belief in the Crown. The Commonwealth's official commemorative book about the tour actually tackled the question of whether the Australian continent had been conquered. Britons never conquered Australia. They were in the van of discovery. They settled it, explored it, hated it and slowly learned to love it. Slowly it conquered them, and they became Australians, fiercely proud of their British origin. 
Australia succumbed wholeheartedly to its young queen. Not time nor power will ever dislodge her from her conquest. Opinion polls showed that a higher proportion of Australians saw the Queen in person during the two-month royal progress than had ever seen her in Britain, where most people were able to watch the coronation on television. The royal tour was quite an event. Upwards of two-thirds of people told the Gallup poll interviewers that they had seen the Queen, you know, passing by. Um, that's quite apart from all the school children that were amassed, of course, because these were people 21 years and over that were asked, not, not all the tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of school children that were amassed to greet her. And not only had the overwhelming proportion of the population seen the Queen, this is in a, directly, this is before the age of television, uh, but some of them, a large number of them, had seen her two or three times. So it was a quite extraordinary event. Uh, not known before that visit, and uh, there was nothing like it. Uh, of course, that was the first visit by a monarch, and certainly not known since. It was a really extraordinary moment in Australian political history. In 1956, another poll showed that over 90% of Australians favoured royal visits, and only 4% opposed them. The Queen didn't visit Australia again until 1963, and by then, it was to quite a different tune. The press spoke of the Queen visiting her people, rather than meeting her subjects. The pomp and pageantry appropriate to a first meeting between a Queen and her subjects was replaced by the Queen learning at first hand what Australians meant when they spoke of a nation on the march. In 1963, the Queen and the Duke fly into Canberra Airport on 707. Not nearly as exciting as coming into the Sydney Heads through on the SS Gothic in 1954. And the press are really rather rather more critical in, in 63. The editorials occasionally wonder about the cost. Oz magazine, which has just started, satirises the tour, something that was almost inconceivable in 1954, when the editorials are in favour and uh, most articles, while they might have mentioned a little bit of criticism. I mean, some municipalities were furious that the Queen wasn't coming to them and, you know, going to the neighbouring municipality or the neighbouring country town. In 63, it's the start of a rather more critical Australia. Many children... Uh, with Treasurer Harold Holt complained from the pulpit of the Wesley Church, Melbourne, that the crowds were not exuberant enough. Although the tour attracted much less press adoration than 1954, most Australian families followed it on television, the medium which most idolised the Queen. Even God Save the Queen was falling from fashion. In 1966, 57% of Australians still preferred it to other anthems. But by 1974, its popularity had fallen to 25%. And in 1984, the Labour government gazetted Advance Australia Fair as the national anthem, after an opinion poll showed that it was the most popular option. A previous Labour government, led by Gough Whitlam, had in 1973 changed the Queen's title to Queen of Australia, removing any direct reference to the United Kingdom and the Church of England. In 1975, the Whitlam government split the Postmaster General's department into Telecom and Australia Post. Australia Post set about systematically removing the E2R from every post box in the land, replacing it with the Commonwealth coat of arms, and more recently, its own secular logo. This deliberate removal of the Queen from the landscape occasioned little comment even from Conservatives. In the last three decades, the Royals have come often for Australian celebrations, such as the Cook Bicentenary in 1970 and the Bicentennial celebrations of 1988, and their offspring and spouses have also visited. Prince Charles spent some of his secondary school years here in the 1960s and his wife, Lady Diana Spencer, 
has been depicted more often in Australian women's magazines in the last decade than any other person on earth. The many Australian readers of these magazines know a great deal about Princess Di's diet, dress, attitudes, child-rearing practices, and the state of her marriage. Other royal marriages have provoked similar attention. The Queen herself still overlooks much of Australia. Her portrait hangs in most municipal chambers, in the meeting rooms of royal societies and many other organisations. Uh, some long distances to attend our quarterly meeting. On my honour, I promise. On my honour, I promise. To do my best. To do my best. To do my duty. To do my duty. To my God. To my God. To the Queen of Australia. To the Queen of Australia. To help other people. To help other people. And to live by the Scout Law. And to live by the Scout Law. The Queen recently made a comeback on the new plastic $5 note, replacing Caroline Chisholm. In response, the Australian Republican movement issued Caroline Chisholm stickers warning the public that defacing the currency can result in up to two years imprisonment. Australian Prime Ministers and Governors General have always welcomed the Queen to our shores. Governors General and State Governors go to great lengths to get their protocol right. In Canberra today, the Queen had to endure some official breaches of protocol. The Prime Minister's wife, Anita, once again angered royalists replacing the traditional curtsy with a bow of the head. And Paul Keating himself abandoned customary deference, his arm around the royal waist. In 1992, Prime Minister Paul Keating was bucketed by the British tabloid press when he placed his hand on the small of the Queen's back to guide her through a crowd. There is no doubt that interest in the royal family remains intense. Their film star status now thrives on the revelations of former courtiers and the photographic record of the royals at play or the royals on the phone or the royals in tears or the royals not talking to each other. Recent best-selling books have summed up the political and reputational dilemma in which the House of Windsor finds itself. Commercial television companies have capitalized on the royal troubles with a spate of dramatized reenactments like this 1992 production, The Fall of the House of Windsor, made in Britain and picked up quickly by Australian television. Shut up, Charles, when you speak such rubbish. Why don't you just say what you mean and get it over with? Or do you have to keep running back to Camilla to complain every time? The mass media continue to feed our appetite for news of the royals. But until recently, historians and political scientists have ignored the monarchy. I think historians have always looked at the connection between Australia and Britain in terms of the economy or in terms of the constitution or parliamentary procedures or national defence. And while those have been important, I think they've overlooked that whole level which has been of the sort of personal affection in the cultural and social parts of our lives. In the 1950s and 60s, the Queen captured the imagination and the respect of her Australian subjects. As she has aged, and as her sometimes troublesome offspring have taken centre stage, the hereditary monarchy in Australia has lost its potency, just as empire and commonwealth have ceased to be politically meaningful. <laughs>